Hello, and welcome to what is going to be a pretty quick recording, because, um, yeah, I'm actually recording this on the 26th of December. I'm not supposed to be doing a recording on Boxing Day, but we had a bit of downtime, and I've... Well, let's put it this way. I cooked lunch. That was fine. I didn't do dinner. Everyone was fine after lunch. <sighs> But, uh, yeah, so, as I wanted a bit of a quiet time, and the video for this wasn't recorded, well, it was recorded, but it's corrupted itself and gone seven times to merry Twitter A due to its, um, for some reason, in the sound terms, I am re redoing it. So, the Albany class, they are rather cool. Now, I have some pictures somewhere of my dad aboard two of these vessels. He managed to go on them and was basically wandering around them and the memory I always have him talking about them was that frankly they were massive in the superstructure but they could do that because they were heavy cruiser hulls and they were built to heavy cruiser standards because the Albany class and I'm still doing shameless book plugs here shameless book plug Shameless store plug, mainly because I'm being shameless. But they were converted Oregon City class, which were really nice cruisers. But you'll notice something about them. Their superstructure isn't exactly massive. No. Yes, displacement, 13,260 long tons in standard. It's cool. And they had significant engine power, 120,000 horsepower. Top speed, 32.4 knots. And they actually did have radars to begin with. And a nice mix of weapons. Especially those 8 inch 55 cals. Nine of them. They're good ships. They are built to the, what I would call, the American standard heavy cruiser format World War II pattern. But they're good ships. You see a lot of these classes come out which look minor evolutions on each one. And it's basically a case of, yeah, you've basically gone copy, paste, and uh, we feel like making this teeny quick here. And now we're going to call it a new class. And you go, really? Well, if that's what you want to say. But they were good in World War II. They were good post-World War II. And they are a very good thing to have around because if you can have them hunting in packs then let's be honest certain battle cruisers which may or may not have been ended up being built by the soviets might have had a hard time dealing with them they could have outrun them but they wouldn't have wanted out trying to fight them but for conversion into missile cruisers you have to do well you have to go radical and i mean really radical this is Chicago. Chicago started off looking like that. Where's my ship gone? If you notice, you'll see that even the bow has been cut down. There is not a single thing above the deck below main deck height, I think, roughly, that has not been stripped off. A large amount of the stuff below that deck has also been taken out and has been moved around. You can see the great big well spaces, really, for want of a better phrase, where guns and magazines were inserted that have been completely stripped bare. Just everything's gone. It's a five-year process. Here comes the thing they get remembered for. Yeah, there's that superstructure. You can never be quite sure what symbology the person who was building this was about, was basing it on, but thank Lord Lubberduck that it was on a heavy cruiser, because that would have been an almighty sail to blow it over and nothing else. And honestly, honestly, there is part of me which thinks that if they'd done the missile conversion on one of the Iowa class ships... They might have gone with a similar structure, or at least a similar heighted structure. 
uh, for them as well. They, they, they have various ideas which go through, and I could see it as a possibility. They might not need to, because some of the conversions put the missiles all on the stern and kept the guns forward. And that would have probably been the best. But, oh my. Whew. Plus the space 16-inch guns provide versus the space 8-inch guns provide. Mm -hmm. But you notice everything's gone. This ship was completely cut down and has been completely rebuilt. There is a solid case to be made here that it would have been a lot cheaper, easier, and more sensible to have just built a new heavy cruiser with missiles attached. Um, seriously, look at the amount of work you're doing. What are you exactly saving money on? What are you saving money on? The construction of the hull? That's cheap! And you have to cut down into everything to do with that. Uh, saving money on the engines? Well, if you really wanted to, you could rip the engines out of this one and install them in a new one. You'd have to break it up for a ship uh, breaker's yard anyway. So, you have probably saved and probably cost yourself a lot more money than just building a new ship. Honestly, you have. And remember, they do three of these. And Chicago's the last. This is another point I have to make about them. Okay. Chicago is commissioned 2nd of May 1964. Albany is commissioned November 1962. Columbus, December 1962. So Chicago is two years behind the other two. It still takes five years and requires you doing all of this. If you're so attached to the name Chicago, just call the new ship Chicago. And here is the final product, and this is the conversion. This is Chicago in her final form and her original form. You'll be noticed that she's got a very nice Azrock launcher. That's useful. And, uh, has missiles fore and aft. And there. Ooh. And, um, yeah. Well, you might also know she has some um, 5 inch 38 Mark 24 guns. Although, for the love of me, I cannot see them on that photo at the moment. I'm sure they are there. I know they're there, but I cannot see them on the photo. Okay. After really digging into the photograph on maximum zoom, I can honestly say I think they are somewhere in this area, but I'm not 100% sure. Honestly. They're 5 inch 38 Mark 24 mounts, and they have them somewhere. And it's sensible to have them. It is sensible. But this is a ship which is built, has been rebuilt around its missiles. And I would also say, to me, there are some interesting quirks in this design from the point of view if I was operating these missiles in this, in this conditions, I wouldn't want to be operating those missiles in rough seas. I wouldn't. And again, this can give you sort of... There are views on arm launchers, etc. And why we go with arm launchers rather than... Uh, we go with VLS rather than arm launchers. And it's one of the interesting discussions we've got into in build prompts a fair number of times now. Whether or not arm launchers should come back. Because you can theoretically stow a lot more in those magazines. But your speed of launch... Speed of launch... Favours the VLS. VLS. 
I have a, my personal view is if you're going to have an arm launcher, you don't want it on the day. You, you don't want it that low or that going into storms. Personal view. Anyway, let's consider these ships and their history. So, Albany. She was the first to be converted and is the namesake for the class. She's rather cool and rather pretty. And you're hearing any thwacks behind me. There's someone wagging their tail going, I want to be patted if I forget to pat them. Now, Albany's career <sighs> once converted was probably a little bit more prestigious. She'd been one of many heavy cruisers, many, many heavy cruisers, when she'd served in original form. But as a missile cruiser, she's one of very few. She had, though, while she was a gun cruiser, mm, carried the official USA's uh, mm, ambassador, representative to the inauguration of the President of Brazil in January 1951 and served as flagship for Commander Battleship Cruiser Force, Atlantic. Hmm. However, after she'd been converted to a guided missile cruiser, well, life starts to change. She took four years. Four years in Boston. And she was the, one, the first one to go for it. Chicago, last one, took five years. She was recommissioned on the 3rd of November, 1962, with a gentleman called Captain Ben P. B. Pickett in charge and commange. And for roughly five years, she focused on either European waters or the West Indies. And she'd alternate between either the Mediterranean, the North Atlantic, or the West Indies. She visited foreign ports, participated in a number of exercises, and in March 1967, she was decommissioned at Boston, Naval Shipyard, once again, to go through 20 months of, no of modifications, because they found issues. In 1968, she's put back in commission, uh, with Captain Alan B. Slaff in command. And in 1973, she was decommissioned for an overhaul at Philadelphia Naval Shipyard. Recommissioned in May 1974, home ported in Norfolk, Virginia, and put under command of Captain John J. Ellicott. Then became the flagship of Second Fleet. Between 1976 and 1980, she was a flagship of Sixth Fleet, home ported in Gaeta, Italy, and was decommissioned on 29th August 1980. She was stricken from Naval Vessel Register on June 1985. But they tried to hold her for a donation as a museum and ship to her namesake city for a further five years. Unfortunately, no feasible plan. She was sold for scrapping on 12th August 1990. Columbus. Ah, the second of the class. And an interesting vessel. She has even an even quieter career than Albany, really. She really does. As a gun cruiser, she patrolled the Taiwan Strait. She'd done all sorts of things versus the Chinese communists. She'd done all sorts of issues she had dealt with and been sent for as a gun cruiser. When she becomes a missile cruiser, she goes through the shortest conversion than either Chicago or Albany. They managed to refit her very quickly. Which makes sense. If you're the second ship, you're supposed to be quicker than the first ship. You're not supposed to be quicker than the third ship. That's supposed to be getting quicker. But no, she then spends the rest of her career in the Pacific. And she is... Finally decommissioned in 1975 and stricken in 1976. Nickname was the Tall Lady. I can't see why when you consider the height of that superstructure. 
And then we have Chicago. Chicago, Chicago. Well, she gets the real benefit boost. She gets all the Vietnam deployments. She gets not just one, not just two, not just three, not four, but five deployments to Vietnam. And gets a whole career after that as well. Because she somehow, somehow, managed to stay in service till 1980. Not be stricken till 1984. And throughout that time, she's doing heavy work. She really is. She's a good ship, but she did take a long time to convert. A long, long time. Her first Vietnam deployment was in May 1966. And basically, with the call sign Red Crown, she was evaluating the concept of radar surveillance of all US Navy air operations over the designated areas of the Gulf and North Vietnam. It was under the program of PIRAS, or Positive Identification and Radar Advisory Zone. The initial duties of tracking friendly aircraft was expanded to include Air Force planes, controlling barrier combat operations, advising support aircraft, and coordinating a strike information from the Air Force Reporting Center at Da Nang in South Vietnam. On the 5th of July, a Sikorsky Sea King search and rescue helicopter operating from Chicago rescued an A4E Skyhawk pilot from Constellation who had ejected off the coast of North Vietnam on the 4th of July. She didn't go to port visit to Hong Kong, where she avoided a typhoon on the 17th of July. Hmm. Always nice to avoid typhoons. She then commenced her second Piraz tour, 29th of July to 11th of August. Assuming the duties of anti-air warfare commander for short periods of time, and demonstrating the ability of a missile cruiser to track complex air operations. After a practice tail off sh missile shot off Okinawa in on the 27th of August and a visit to Keelung, Taiwan, she returned to the Pira station for September, 7th of September to 29th of September. Expanding air duties even further became the primary source for MIG warning information and assuming surveillance responsibility for the North Vietnamese Chinese border. Again, this is an advantage of ships. You can park an incredibly powerful radar off in international waters and watch things. And if people go after you, you're in trouble. That basically covers most of the points of Vietnam and most of her career thereafter. They weren't the only Oregon City class though converted. There was also Northampton. Because heavy cruisers are good for conversions because they tend to be very solidly built. Which also makes converting them an absolute nightmare because they are solidly built. But it means you can do stuff with their hull. And this had a lot done with its hull. Yes, it has, hasn't it? I know, fluffy research assistant, you are upset with me for <laughs> not concentrating you enough. You are upset. I know. I know. I know. I know. You never believe in suffering and science, do you? So, Northampton, when commissioned as the floating White House, well, is slightly different. She becomes the national... Hello. Oh, good lord. There's a takeover of a poodle. The uh, National Emergency Command Post afloat, which was important in the times of nuclear war, when they thought that a massive strike against America might well knock out land facilities. And it might do. She's one of two ships to serve in a role. The other being the aircraft carrier USS Wright. She was modified with an extra deck, tallest communications mast in the Navy, and multi-link communications gear. Plus you can see her gunners have kind of changed. She's gone from having, you know, quite a few heavy guns to far, far smaller guns, but quite a few of them as well. Provide air defence. And the whole purpose really is to keep 
well, either the heavy cruiser or the aircraft carrier at sea at all times. Uh, they were also anything ships uh, in mid-1964, and only one was ever imported any one time. Northampton was mar only marginally upgraded since it was due for replacement. And right, the aircraft carrier was modified far more heavily. The idea being that would hold National Command authorities for an indefinite period, whereas the Northampton was the backup if the right was needed and needed to come into shore. They did actually consider a submarine, the USS Triton, for the NECA and NECA role in the early 1960s, after its radar picket mission became obsolete, but um, for some reason decided that wasn't really practical. Probably because of space and accommodation, and the fact you're dealing with a lot of people who haven't signed up for the submarine service, you'd be jamming them on a submarine. And as we all know, if you, someone flushes the, su the loo wrong in a submarine, you can sink it. Do you really want a load of people on board who don't, haven't ever had any submarine training on a submarine in the circumstances? They might be stressed out, mightn't they? They might be. Right. Thank you very much, everyone. Hope you enjoyed. Sorry it's not a long video. Or as long as I probably could do on this class. But as I said, I'm doing something quickly. And... I've got been I've used as much time as I'm allowed on my little time monitor here is telling me off. Aren't you? You are. So... Hope you've all had a good Christmas, take care, and enjoy, and, well, tomorrow, probably back to normal in terms of recording time. Take care. Bye. Ooh, ooh, hello. You're trying to kill your papa. Oh, it's all after a biscuit, is it? You give me a time extension if I give you a biscuit. Mm -hmm. Oh, and um, question day. Any funny conversions of ships you can think about? Because honestly, that superstructure does make me laugh a little bit. Because it's just so massive. There are good reasons for it, I know, but still, it is a bit massive. Leahy class tomorrow, and Belknap class on Wednesday. Haven't recorded either of those yet, but will do. Take care, and hope you enjoyed.